this short video, we're going to talk about the divergent function, which is also known as the Gaussian theorem. It's another one of our fundamental theorems in reductive analysis. So, if you remember when we first started talking about divergence, we went through a little exercise where we tried to calculate how much of a vector field was flowing out of a closed curve in the plane. So we had a vector field in the plane F, a closed curve C, and we went through the derivation like we did with the uh, Green's theorem, actually. We made use of Green's theorem, and as a result of Green's theorem, we came up with the notion that the flux across the curve uh, was equal to the double integral over the interior of the curve of the divergence of the vector field. So that was for two dimensions. So the divergence theorem really just extends this to three dimensions. So in three dimensions, the corresponding problem would be, suppose I have a vector field and I want to know how much of it's passing through the surface of this, a, through a closed surface. And so, um, that would be its flux. We talk about flux integrals. So that flux would be how much of that vector field passes through the surface. And it's the net flow out. So what we're going to do is start with a, a simple surface that we know we can split into a top surface and a bottom surface. In my example, uh, there happens to be some symmetry, but there doesn't need to be. S1 and S2 need not have any symmetry at all, but they both have to be uh, representable as functions of x and y. And then if we look at our vector field, it has three component functions, p, q, and r. So the flux of f across the surface s uh, can be written, well, in terms of its components. And remember this ds really means you're dotting it with the unit normal vector. And so I could distribute that dot product across each of the three components. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the k component here, the flux of the function that corresponds to the k component of f across the surface. And the reason is because the uh, k vector is pointing in the positive z direction, and we have z, I mean, each surface as a function of x and y. So we'd have a z1, which is a function f, and a z2, which is a function g. So the flux of this component across the surface can be written as two integrals, the bottom half and the top half. And it would make sense because both the top and the ha bottom half can be written as functions of x and y, that we would like to use x and y as parameters. So on the top, I'd have a parametric representation r1. And so x would equal x and y would equal y and z would be the formula for f of x and y. And then as we've seen before, that the uh, cross product of the partial of r1 with respect to x times the partial of r1 with respect to y would have components negative partial of f with respect to x, negative partial of f with respect to y, and then one in the k component. And that is a normal vector to uh, the uh, top surface. It's not a unit normal vector, but that's we don't need the unit normal vector uh, for our analysis. In the bottom, we would have a different parametric representation. So R2, its components would be, well, x would equal x and y would equal y, and then the, now z equals g of x and y. And so if I look at the cross product 
partial of R2 with respect to X times the partial of R2 with respect to Y, I'll get, well, the negative partial of G with respect to X, then the negative partial of G with respect to Y, and then one, again, in the K component. Now I say that this is the opposite of the normal vector for the bottom surface, because uh, remember, we're gonna orient this surface in a positive way, which for a closed surface means you have to have the normal vector going outwards. So outward on the bottom means going down. So we need to have the bottom surface oriented downward. And so I know all of these uh, different differentials and normal vectors can get a little confusing, but as a quick reminder, this is what our notation means is that we would have uh, our ds as a vector, meaning the unit normal vector times the uh, surface area differential here. Remember that surface area differential was just the length of that cross product of u and v are your parameters, r sub u cross r sub v times dA. Your unit normal is, well, the cross product r sub u cross r sub v divided by the, its length, and so that length divides out. And so all we're really needing is the r sub u cross r sub v. And in, so in our cases, that would be these cross product vectors. That's what we want to focus on. All right, so again, using that notation, that would mean that our unit normal vector times uh, ds would be just negative f sub x, negative f sub y, and 1 times dA. And then for the lower half, so it's oriented downwards, I would have positive g sub x, positive g sub y, and then negative 1. So now in our integral, what are we going to do? It's going to be dotted with that k unit vector. Well, if I take this cross product vector or this cross product vector, let's start with the top first, and I dot it with k, I'll just get 1. So I just wind up with 1 dA. And then in the bottom, I'll have negative 1. So I'll just have negative 1 dA or negative dA which means that my two integrals here, the first k dot n1 ds turns out to be just dA, and the second k dotted with, let me put a dot there, n2 ds, that's just going to be a negative dA. So I could go ahead and we're going to see that they're going to have a uh, common uh, domain of integration because both of these, they share this common boundary. So when you project it onto the xy plane, you're going to get the same region. So you could write this as a single integral. It's going to be the integral over the region D. So here's our region D right here. And then we just have R dA minus R dA. But now, of course, it's not just the same R because we have to write it using our parametric representation, which means that X stays at X and Y stays with Y, but we replace Z in our first integral with F of X comma Y. And in the second integral, we replace it with G of X comma Y. So this integrand right here looks like the result from an evaluation. It looks like what I've done is taken the function r of x comma y comma z and evaluated it between z equals g of x comma y and z equals f of x comma y. And where do we get an evaluation from? Well, we have to do an evaluation after we perform an integral. So what kind of integral would lead to this evaluation? Well, you think to yourself, oh, 
Well, R would be the partial antiderivative with respect to z of what function? Well, the partial of r with respect to z. Just from the fundamental theorem of calculus, if I take the antiderivative of the partial of r with respect to z, I take the antiderivative with respect to z, that's just going to give me the function r back again. So this evaluation could come from this integral right here, where my lower bound is z equals g of x comma y. My upper bound is z equals f of x comma y. So you can see that, oh yeah, if I was finding the triple integral of a function over this solid, uh, what would I do? Well, I would look at the top surface and the bottom surface, and then I would have a double integral over the projection onto the xy plane. And that's exactly what I have here. I have my integral with respect to z, with the lower bound being the bottom surface, the upper bound being the top surface. And then outside of that, I have a double integral over that region d. So that really is just a triple integral over the interior of the surface of the partial of r with respect to z. So again, e is the interior of our original surface s. So that was only for the k component of our flux integral. But for our k component, we found that the flux of that r component function across the surface could be found by the triple integral of the partial of r with respect to z. Now, there's nothing special about the k component. I could repeat the same exercise, the same logic. Instead of having a top and bottom function, I would either have a front and back surface or a left and right surface. But in the end, I can apply the same analysis and find that, oh, the flux of the i component function p across s is going to be the triple integral over the solid of the partial of p with respect to x dv. And for the j component q, its flux will be the triple integral over e of the partial of q with respect to y. And so if I want to find the uh, flux of the entire vector field, all three components, well, I'd have to add together all three of those triple integrals. And when I do that, I recognize that the integrand is just the divergence of f. And so I can find the flux, meaning what is the net flow out of that surface by the vector field f by evaluating the uh, divergence of f as the integrand of a triple integral over the interior of s. And that's what the divergence theorem tells us. Now, what are the conditions? We want to have a simple solid region. That's our E. S is the boundary surface. And it's going to have a positive orientation, meaning it should be outward. We need to have a smooth vector field. Smooth really means it has continuous partial derivatives on an open region containing E. Then the flux of F across the surface S is the same as the triple integral over the interior of the divergence of F. I just said that. And this divergence theorem, again, is also called Gauss's theorem. So let's look at some examples. Let's calculate the flux of the vector field with components x minus y squared, 3y, and x cubed minus z outward over the sphere with radius 3. So rho equals 3 is the equation of the sphere in spherical coordinates. 
So to calculate the divergence, so we're going to use the divergence theorem. I need the partial of x of the first component plus the partial of y with, of the second component. And finally, the partial with respect to z of the third component. Uh, now the uh, divergence is usually a much simpler function to work with. It's a scalar. And in this case, it turns out to be just a constant. So now we would have the triple integral over the sphere with radius 3 of this constant 3 times dv. Well, that's just 3 times the volume of the sphere. And the volume of the sphere is pi r cubed. So we work that out and we get 108 pi. Here's a second example. Uh, we have a little bit more complicated uh, vector field. Its components functions are x squared y, x, y, and y squared z cubed. And now our uh, surface here is a cube centered at the origin. It's bounded by the planes x equals plus or minus 1, y equals plus or minus 1, and z equals plus or minus 1. Now, when I find the divergence of f, it's not a constant, but it's not very complicated. It's just a polynomial. But uh, the solid, the cube here, uh, means that the bounds on, of integration on our triple integral are all constants. They're all negative 1 at the bottom and positive 1 at the top. And so that's going to make it fairly simple to evaluate this integral. If I start with dx, now I could put the evaluation in any order, but I'm going to start with dx on the inside because I recognize that both 2xy and x are odd functions in x, which means that since my bounds of integration are opposites of each other, the uh, evaluation for those first two terms is going to give me zero. So I really only need to be concerned about the evaluation of the third term. And again, I could even take advantage of symmetry here, but um, I'll just work it out. That's just going to mean I'm going to have twice uh, 3y squared z squared, so 6y squared z squared. Now I have to take the antiderivative with respect to y. That would give me one third y cubed. Well, one third of six gives me two. I'm going to evaluate that between negative one and two. So that would just give me two z squared. Uh, so two times two will make four. Now I'll take the antiderivative of z squared with respect to z. And that's four thirds z cubed. And again, between negative one and one means I'll just wind up multiplying that by two to get eight thirds as the final value. Now, it wouldn't be terribly challenging to evaluate this particular uh, flux integral directly, but you have all six faces. Remember, we did an example where we had a box, and, and uh, it's, it, none of the individual ones are very difficult, but there's just a lot of work involved in working through all uh, six of those faces. So let's go back and uh, revisit the idea of having flux integrals of divergence-free vector fields. We looked at this when we studied Stokes' theorem. And so we can get the same result, but from a different point of view, looking at it in terms of the divergence theorem. So if I want to calculate the flux of a vector field across an open surface, uh, with some given orientation. At this point, it doesn't really matter whether it's oriented up or down for our technique here. Well, I couldn't use the divergence theorem with an open surface. Remember, one of the requirements is that I must be trying to find the flux across a closed surface. So whenever you have an open surface, you cannot use the divergence theorem directly. But there is a way that it can help us, maybe. 
So if we can find another surface, S hat, which has the same boundary as the surface S, I may be able to uh, take the union of S with S hat and create a closed surface uh, where it's the interior is a simple solid. So like here, I have a surface, uh, which I'm not going to bother with the uh, actual uh, equation of the function here. Uh, it is uh, quite complicated. Um, but what I could do is try to put another surface, which is very simple, like a disk, connect it to the original surface. And now I've got combining the two surfaces, I have a closed surface. And I might be able to use the divergence theorem there. So the key here is, again, if you have a complicated surface here, maybe you can use a much simpler surface to create a closed surface. So we'll choose the right orientation so that the corresponding closed surface is oriented uh, consistent with the original surface. And then we can apply the divergence theorem, which would say that the flux across the closed surface, so that is really the sum of the flux across both surfaces, is uh, going to be the triple integral over the interior of the divergence of F. So you could maybe benefit from this even if the divergence of f is not zero, because it might be very easy to calculate, say, the flux across the disk. It might be very easy to calculate the divergence over the solid. Uh, and so that would be easier than trying to work with the very complicated original surface. But if the divergence of f is zero, so we have a divergence-free vector field, then we could say that, oh, the flux over the original surface would just be the opposite over the flux of the new surface. And so, and again, the idea would be that the new surface is much simpler, and so calculating the flux across that would be much simpler. So let's look at an example where we try to take advantage of it. Here we have a, an open surface. It's a hemisphere. It's the unit hemisphere. It's oriented upward. And uh, we have the vector field with component functions yz, xz, and x squared plus y. So I can't use the divergence theorem with just this open surface here. But what I can do is try to close this off. And the natural way to close it off, I could use another hemisphere to complete the sphere. That's one thing I could do. But I'm going to just use something even simpler. I'm going to use the disk, the unit disk, in the xy plane. So if I take s union with the disk, now I've got a closed hemisphere. I've got a closed surface. Now, we said that the hemisphere was oriented upwards. So to make the closed surface outward oriented, the disk has to be oriented downward. And you can see that if I look at the divergence of this vector field, the partial of the first component with respect to x is 0. The partial derivative of the second component with respect to y is 0. And the partial derivative of the third component with respect to z is also 0. So this vector field is divergence free. So we just saw from our result that as a result of the divergence theorem that the flux across the hemisphere is going to be the opposite of the flux across D when D is oriented downward. 
So what we're going to do is to uh, not bother with this minus sign. We're just going to, um, instead of having the flux across the downward oriented disk, we'll just uh, rename it d hat and we'll orient it upward. And so then all I need to do in order to find the flux across the original hemisphere is just calculate the flux across this upward oriented disk. Well, this disk, the natural way to parameterize it would be to use X and Y as parameters. Uh, and in this case, Z is identically zero. Uh, it's this disk is in the X, Y plane. That's going to help us a lot because if you go up here to our original vector field, then um, the first and second components are going to be identically zero. Now the cross product, a normal vector for that disk has got to be the uh, unit vector pointing in the positive Z direction. So our K unit vector. And uh, if I look at F in terms of our parameterization, like I said, Z is going to be zero. So the first two component for, uh, are zero. And then the last component doesn't change. That's just going to be x squared plus y. Then the flux across the disk can be written as the double integral over the disk of x squared plus y dA. Now we have a disk here, so it would make sense to convert everything to polar, polar coordinates and then to use r d r d theta for dA. So I went ahead and distributed the r in, across the terms in the integrand. So the cosine, the x squared would give me r squared cosine squared theta. Multiply that by r and you'll get r cubed. The y would be r sine theta, but I multiply that by r to get r squared sine theta. And my bounds just go from zero to two pi for theta and zero to one for r. So go ahead and take the antiderivative here and reevaluate it with the, from zero to one. Well, that's just gonna be in the first term, one fourth r to the fourth. So that'll give me a one fourth. And then one third r to the cubed, evaluated r to the third power, r cubed, evaluated from zero to one. That'll just give me my one third. Now I went ahead and replaced cosine squared theta with our identity, one half in parentheses, cosine two theta plus one. And now I look that I have bounds here that are supposed to be from zero to two pi, not zero to two. And so I know that when I take the antiderivative of sine theta, I'll get cosine theta, but cosine of zero and cosine of two pi are the same thing. So that evaluation gives me nothing. And the same idea with cosine of two theta, when I take its antiderivative, I get uh, one half sine of two theta, but evaluating that between zero and two pi will also give me zero. So the only term that will contribute uh, to the evaluation is the constant. So I have one fourth times one half times one. So that's one eighth. Then I'll have the integral from zero to pi of d theta. And that works out to pi over four. So I'd like to finish this lecture with something that's not in the book, but I just feel that it should be important in any uh, vector calculus class. And we just touch on vector calculus, but we touch on it enough that we should appreciate this decomposition. It's the Helmholtz decomposition or the Helmholtz theorem. And it's known as the fundamental theorem of vector calculus. And what it says that if you have a vector field on a bounded domain E, and it's smooth. It has continuous second order partial derivatives. Then you can find a scalar function f and a vector field g where your original vector field f can be 
written as the sum of the gradient of the scalar f plus the curl of g. So you can think of f as being a uh, scalar potential of part of f and g as being a vector potential of another part of f. And we know that the gradient field is going to be curl-free or irrotational. And we know that the gradient of a vector field, not the gradient, the curl of a gradient field is going to be divergence-free or solenoidal. So our Helmholtz decomposition says that if you have a smooth vector field on a bounded region, you can write it as the sum of a curl-free vector field plus a divergence-free vector field.